Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everybody. This is Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me. Uh, sort of sequestered away today because of some bad weather, so as often is the case, audio may sound a little different than it normally does, but it's good that we're still able to get together. <laughs> and It's been sort of a, a cold, chilly time of late where we live. I want to continue looking through uh, 2 Thessalonians right now, and really at one of my uh, favorite passages. Um, there's so much to be gleaned uh, from this passage, so I'm going to take it sort of slow. Uh, we've already seen in the last episode, in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, that Paul said that he wanted to communicate some things to them concerning, again, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. And he told him, he said, don't be easily unsettled or alarmed or anything like that, okay? And it's sort of good to read different translations to find out how they translate. The New American Standard said, don't be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed, you know? And you think, well, what was disturbing them? Well, by a spirit, someone who might have stood up and been speaking in the spirit of what they thought was the Lord, but it wasn't. It was the spirit of their flesh, and they were uh, speaking something that wasn't true. Or a message, as someone who's teaching, someone who's preaching, or a letter, as if from us, and all of these would be to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So apparently there were people that were already saying that the day of the Lord has occurred and we have been left behind. And then he gives them a, a, just a directive here. At verse 3, he said, let no one in any way deceive you. And we see that Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, where he said, see to it that no one deceive you. So we have a role, a responsibility. We also have the ability to not be deceived. Quite often people think, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. Well, here's how we're able to not be deceived. We have the Word of God. So if you know the Word of God, we have the power of the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. A true believer has the Holy Spirit within him. And then we have the body of Christ. You know, quite often that was forgot. We have one another, and we can help and encourage one another and speak forth the truth of one another. So he says, see to it that no one among you are deceived. Why is that? He says, because the apostasy must come first. And he actually says, don't you remember I told you this before, that the apostasy is going to come first, and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Okay, And then he gives a little detail about that man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God and object of worship. In other words, he's going to become the God of the pagan gods. He's going to oppose all them. He's going to exalt himself. The world's going to worship this guy. And he's literally going to take his seat in the temple of God. And he's going to display himself as being God. And he's going to call himself God. So we've seen this already, and you would do well to uh, hang out here in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and really take the Scripture in. Now, quite often what happens, people say, well, uh, you will automatically start trying to line up this Scripture with your uh, eschatological viewpoint. In other words, what you think about the end time. And so don't do that. Just look to see what it says. If it reveals something you've never seen before that draws into question what you thought you knew, well, hallelujah, <laughs> you know, change your thinking. Line it up with the Scripture. Boy, I go through that all the time, right? So he tells them, don't you remember that I was with you? While I was with you, I was telling you these things. Now listen to verse 6. Verse 5, let me read it again. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? So he's saying this to them. He's saying, come on, guys, remember. Remember what I said? Now verse 7. And you know, I mean, verse 6, you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. That right there is a profound verse because the body of Christ in Thessalonica knew what it was that was restraining this man of lawlessness. And notice the word now. You know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. Well, in the balance of the letter, Paul writes, and he doesn't really tell us what it is that restrains. I wish he told us, right? Though, to the balance of the Scripture, I think we can find out and that it's readily clear what it is. But there's a couple other things. There's something that is restraining him. You know what restrains him 
Now, and the context is he's talking about the man of lawlessness. So does this mean that the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, that he was alive then, it is going to be alive later? In other words, who is the him? And then it said this, so that in his time, he will be revealed. So let me tell you what I think this is. I think it's a picture. Uh, when you read John, read First John, it talks about the Antichrist. And it says, yeah, the Antichrist is to come, but the, the spirit of the Antichrist is now. So even in the first century, the spirit of the Antichrist was there. And that which would come against Christ is there already. The man of lawlessness, okay, the Antichrist, will be empowered by Satan himself. He will be a human. Okay? And he will be a human, and at some point in time, Satan will enter into him, much like what happened uh, with Judas. Remember that? Judas had decided to uh, uh, turn against Jesus, had already cut the deal for the 30 pieces of silver. And then when they're having the meal together and the Lord gives him the morsel, it said that Satan entered into him. And I believe the same thing is going to happen to this man. So this man is going to be going along. Now, he's going to make all the deals. He's going to do all the chicanery and everything, and he's an active part of this. But at some point in time, which I think we do know, we'll get into that later, at uh, some point in time, Satan will enter into him. But in the meantime, something is hindering Satan. Something is restraining Satan. Okay, Something is holding him back. And, boy, you'll read all sorts of um, opinions is what that is. A lot of people say, oh, it's the church. It's the church. The church is what's holding back. Uh, no, you don't see that anywhere in Scripture. Other people say it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what's holding him back. No, you really don't see that anywhere in Scripture either. And I think it goes back to what we uh, saw earlier in the writings to uh, the Thessalonians. Uh, let's go back to Daniel chapter 12. Let me read you this passage right here, because this is really, really useful. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 is the last chapter of Daniel. And it begins like this in verse 1. It says, Now, at that time, and you have to say, well, what time? Well, you have to go back and read the end of chapter 9, 10, 11, then up to 12 to sort of get the context of it. Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who guards over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. And so I think what we see right here, and when you read the next three, four verses, there's even more insight into it, but we're running out of time here. What you see is that Michael is the archangel who stands guard over the Jewish people, stands guard over the people. But there's going to be a time when Michael arises. And a lot of times people think that this arising is him arising up to do battle for his people, to protect his people. No, 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 no. He stands guard for his people right now. That's what he's doing. He's standing guard right now. When you look at the uh, uh, Hebrew of, of this right here, the Aramaic too, but basically the Hebrew, when you look at this, you find out that that will arise means that he's going to cease doing it. He's going to step aside and quit guarding his people. When he does that, there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. That is exactly the same uh, verbiage, the same words that Jesus used in Matthew 24 to describe what was going to happen to Israel in the Great Tribulation. Okay, And that's what's going to bring forth the Great tri Tribulation. I believe that what uh, Paul was referring to when he told the Thessalonians that, hey, you know what it is uh, that restrains him right now, that Michael is that which restrains him. So Michael restrains that evil against Israel. Is there evil in the world? Well, absolutely there's evil in the world, okay? But there's something uh, that... Michael is protecting Israel right now, but a day is coming when that protection is going to be lifted off. And the man of lawlessness is going to come against Israel. It's going to come against the church. How do I know that? Go read Revelation 12. It tells you point blank. Point blank. Okay. And so a man of lawlessness will be empowered uh, by Satan himself, will come against Israel and come against the church in what is called the Great Tribulation. These folks right here, he says, you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. Verse 7 gives us more insight. Let me just read it. Our time's up. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Tell you what, we'll pick it up right there again the next time, okay? I'm, again, I'm Dale. I'll see you then. Goodbye.